The last thing that we want to talk about is things to consider when you're collecting data or actually even when you're reading data. Um, in terms of this section, there's really nothing to take notes on. I just want you to hear everything and kind of know some of these key phrases because they're going to come up a lot later. So the first one is the context of data. What is the data really about? So perhaps there's a study out there where they asked a bunch of college students, how much time do you spend on coursework? And they found the average to be 10 hours a week. Now if somebody read that report and turned around and based on that reported that students don't spend enough time studying each week, that's not really helpful in the sense that that's not what the data was about. When the students were asked how much time they spent on coursework, that could have involved time in class, how long they spent on their homework, group projects. So the data wasn't about time studying. A second problem that could happen is the source of the data. Is the information actually coming from a reliable source? Um, 2A talks about self-selection bias. This is where if you go to a website and it says, you know, vote here for your favorite actor, and you might think, eh, I have a couple people I like, but I don't really care to vote. So if it turns around and the report comes out that, um, you know, I don't know who the top actor is right now, let's just say, you know, John Smith is the number one actor out there, you might be thinking, I haven't met a single person who likes John Smith. And it's because only the people who are passionate about him are the people who voted. So had the study said, of the people who voted on our website, that might have, you know, kind of helped correct that self-selection bias. Or like in the case of 2B, missing responses or non-representative populations. There's the famous 1936 presidential election where Franklin Roosevelt was not expected to win, but he did. The company who said he was going to lose the election had been famous for predicting the president for all the prior elections. But in this particular year, they had conducted their study using the telephone and most of the people who voted did not have a telephone. So they missed such a large population that they got inaccurate results. Question, or question three, <laughs> type three, um, the sampling method, was it effective? Uh, in three, it talks about blind studies. This is where if you are giving somebody a drug to see if it helps you know, ha um, cure headaches, whatever the case may be, that half the population gets the actual new drug that they're testing, and the other half of the population gets what's called a placebo, which is just a sugar pill, because they want to make sure that this new proposed drug actually had an effect versus, you know, some nothing. Well, if this, the um, participants don't know what they're getting, there's a whole theory of mind over matter that if they don't know what they're getting, they may be kind of more neutral, whereas if... Uh, participant thought they were getting the new drug, they might incline to just feel that their headache goes away. And then if you are doing something of that method, it's always best to do what's called a double blind study, which is the person who's administering the medication doesn't know either. Because if they know, even though they know the patient doesn't know, they might somehow give off some sort of vibe like, oh, this one's really going to help you today. And that may, you know, influence the person. 3B talks about the designing of a questionnaire, the wording, the ordering. Those can all play a role. Um, consider that if you were taking a survey and it said, you know, you don't really like spinach, do you? That's going to kind of influence you the way it's worded. Or maybe if the first question says, do you think it's okay for people to go without food? You'll answer however you feel. But when the next question asks, do you think there should be school lunch programs that provide free lunch so that nobody goes without food? You're inclined to answer it based on what you were just thinking from the question above. Had the two questions been flip-flopped, you might get different results from the same person. And then there's always the issue of a, it, who the interviewer is in the case of a survey. Maybe it's somebody who's intimidating, or maybe it's somebody you really want to impress and you're answering the questions you wait the way you think they want them answered. Um, the next thing to look at is the conclusion. You know, what is the data really saying? And the biggest one here is probably cause versus correlation. 
what happens is there was a famous, another famous study, there's lots of them, where um, they followed the pregnancies of I don't know how many people, and they found, though, that all of the women who had healthy babies, the majority of them had all had lobster at some point during their pregnancy. And so it's easy to assume that having the lobster caused these women to have a healthy baby, where that's not true. It was just a correlation that women who can afford to have lobsters also can afford to have good health care and can afford to take work off and do bed rest if they need to or whatever the case is. So it just happened to be something that happens with that group. Number five, what are the practical implications? Like what are we going to turn around and do with this information? Let's say I survey everybody in this class and I find out that 65% of you drive a car to work. So based on that, do I decide it's okay to be five minutes late to class because parking is a problem? Probably not, because just because you drove to school doesn't mean that this is your first class. And secondly, what if our class is at 8 a.m.? Parking shouldn't be a problem then, and really you should prepare for parking. So in practicality, knowing 65% of people drive to school doesn't help me with that, Although maybe I would want to do more examples having to do with gas mileage since it would affect more of the class. I don't know. Uh, question six. Sorry, I keep saying question. Um, point six is what is the statistical significance? And this one comes up in all sorts of different ways. But, you know, if you knew that there was a one in a million chance of winning the lottery, then it's probably not going to happen. But every time you watch the news and see some winner reported, you're tempted to think, but it could happen and it does happen to somebody. But at the same time, you know, what if there is a one in 1,000 chance that you're going to get into a car accident today? Based on that, would you choose not to drive? I mean, it statistically has shown up as something that happens every day. If you listen to the news, they're always talking about a wreck on the freeway. But it's not significant. Statistically, it's hard to say all of a sudden, significant enough to prevent you from driving. Although if there was a one in a thousand chance that you could die from a certain surgery and you didn't really need the surgery, you might go without it. So just a lot of different things to think about.